see your faces out there. Let's stand this morning as we get ready to praise and worship the Lord. And welcome to those who are online joining us as well. There is nothing that's impossible for our God. Amen. I believe there is no doubt cause I have seen your faithfulness my fortress over and over I have a hope found in your I have a strength found in your grace, your faithfulness, my fortress over and over. Inside of me, unleash your power for all to see. Spirit, come and fall on us over and over. Oh, Lord, make way through the waters, walk me through the fire, do what you want. Then we ask or think, Lord, you will never fail. Your name is powerful. Your word's unstoppable. All things are possible in you. God of exceedingly, God of abundantly, more than we
You may be seated. Well, I too want to extend a welcome to you today. Uh, thanks for joining us here at Community Reform Church. Especially want to welcome any of you who are visiting with us today. Especially glad that you're here. Hope that if there's any way that we can be helpful and you're kind of getting a sense of who we are or what it is to be around here, um, just encourage you to ask, but glad that you've joined us for worship today. A couple announcements before we step into that. One is, um, as many of you know, the Faith walking has been an important part of our church for the last probably 10 years almost already. And there is an opportunity for um, you to participate, although it's changed names. They're now calling it the Kingdom Journey, and Faith Reformed Church in Traverse City is hosting that. And it really lines up with one of the key values that we're taking on as a church, which is relational discipleship. And part of our commitment as a church is to provide opportunities multiple opportunities for us to have opportunities to do discipleship kind of things. And it's relational. It's not just one-on-one, just one on God. It is also in relationship with each other. And this opportunity is coming up next weekend at Faith Reformed Church. It is Saturday from 8.30 till 8.30. It's a long day, but it's a good day. And Sunday from 8.30 till 3.30, that kind of gives you the experience of the kingdom journey. And then there is an opportunity to continue. You don't have to, but then there's a coaching um, part of it that will go on for a number of weeks where you'll have a chance to meet with a coach kind of probably through zoom if it's at a distance but to continue the discipleship journey and so if you're interested in finding out more about that let me know you can go to faith reform church's website in traverse city and click on kingdom journey and it'll show you how to register it'll give you all sorts of information but it's one of the opportunities that exist to grow so if you're interested in pursuing that or you have questions for me don't hesitate to ask And then next week's communion, so we're still in that place where we're encouraging you to bring your own elements. We will have some elements here for folks that forget or don't come prepared for that, but we are encouraging you to bring your own elements and prepare for communion. You know, this could be a good week to do some self-examination. Is there anything that's separating you in relationship with God that needs to be addressed as you come and celebrate in communion next week? And then also, we have multiple opportunities for kids this summer. Spring Hill is one of those. That's K through 5, and that's, I think, June 14th through 18th. You can sign up by going to our website and clicking on the camping opportunities. There's opportunities for middle school students. They're going to be going to Young Life's Camp in Timberwolf Lake in the beginning of August. And there's opportunities for high school students to do a backpacking um, trip this summer, and that's going to take place the end of June into the beginning of July. So all that information is on our website, but if you're a student, really encourage you to consider participating in those, and please, please, please never let money keep you from going. We will find a way to make sure that you're able to go. Well, what a gift it is that God's called us together, and that we have this unique opportunity to see each other, kind of, to have a chance to be reminded about who we are, and reminded about the gift that God is and who he is. And I hope also this is a space that we recognize God's going to call us to grow and that this is part of that growth taking place as we not only worship him, but as we also open ourselves up to the ways that he's calling us maybe to change or alter our thinking, or maybe there's some patterns of behaviors that we need to confront or change, but that we would be open to what God wants to do in our lives through this time together. Will you pray with me as we ask him to lead us? God, we're so thankful for the gift that you are, for your presence in the midst of all of our life, but in this unique way that we gather together. And I pray that you would help us to be open to that. What do you want to show us, and how are you going to encourage us to grow? Maybe there's some things in our life that we need some conviction We need to see that sin and call it what it is and confess it. Maybe we're coming today just discouraged, uncertain, fearful, exhausted. And Father, we're thankful that you are a God that meets us where we are and that you always, always, always promise to provide what we need. So help us, Father, to experience the gift that you are to us. Help this time as we sing, as we listen, as we think. May what we do be an act of worship toward you. And we thank you especially for your son, Jesus Christ, and his love seen most clearly on a cross. And we celebrate in a tomb that's empty, and that you are God. So help us to celebrate in you today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Well, we're going to start today with the installation and ordination of our new elders and deacons. And normally, this would have taken place a couple of months ago, so it's a little late, but partly because of COVID and partly because it just didn't seem to fit well and partly because I kind of forgot. Um, <laughs> here we are. And so I, I'm going to invite Doug Bowens, who's the vice president of consistory, to join me. And he and I are going to take us through the liturgy, and we'll be inviting those new elders and deacons up here in a moment. So, beloved in the Lord, brothers and sisters in Christ, we have come to ordain and install elders and deacons today in Christ's holy church. Christ alone is the source of all Christian ministry through the ages, calling men and women to serve. By the Holy Spirit, all who believe and are baptized receive a ministry to witness to Jesus as Savior and Lord and to love and serve those with whom they live and work. We are ambassadors for Christ who reconciles and makes whole. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. Following Christ's resurrection and ascension, God has given the church apostles, prophets and teachers, deeds of power, gifts of healing, forms of assistance and leadership. We stand within a tradition where God calls and empowers deacons and elders and ministers of word and sacrament. The following people have been chosen to serve the office of deacon and elder. To be ordained and installed to the office of deacon, Krista Jerima and Vinnie Kloster. To be installed as deacon, Mark Cousins. To be ordained and installed as elder, Joanne Deckinga. To be installed as elder, Bill Mings Sr. Deacons and elders are called to serve as Christ served to look to them to be people of spiritual commitment, exemplary, exemplary life, compassionate spirit, and sound judgment. Deacons are set apart for a ministry of mercy, service, and outreach. They gather gifts and offerings, care for them faithfully, and distribute them with wisdom and compassion to persons in need. And for purposes that advance God's kingdom on earth. Deacons visit and comfort the distress, provide for whatever necessities may arise, and assist the congregation in service of worship. Elders are set apart for a ministry of watchful and responsible care for the welfare, welfare and order of the church. They have oversight of all members, including one another, the deacons, and the ministers, equipping everyone to live in harmony with God's word. They ensure the word of God is rightly proclaimed and taught and the sacraments faithfully administered. Elders assist the ministers with their good counsel and serve all Christians with advice, consolation, and encouragement. Elders and deacons together with the ministers form the consistory to lead God's people in proclaiming good news to the poor, righteousness to the nations, and peace among all. The consistory provides for the welfare of the church, stewardship of property and finance, and the spiritual benefit and growth of all Christ's people. As the three offices of deacon, elder, and minister of word and sacrament are united in Christ, so also in the church, one office is not separate from the others. The minister of word and sacrament does not serve without the elder and neither without the deacon. Together they enable the whole mission of the church, Everything in the church will be done decently and in order when faithful persons are called to office and responsibly fulfill their charge. So brothers and sisters, before Almighty God and in the presence of this congregation, answer sincerely these questions. Do you confess together with us in the church throughout the ages your faith in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? So I want to invite all of us to stand as we affirm some of those foundations of faith as we read together the Apostles' Creed. You're going to see that on the screen. So together we read, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, 
the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. So we continue with these questions. Do you believe in your heart that you are called by Christ's church and therefore by God to this office? Do you believe the books of the Old and New Testaments to be the word of God and the perfect doctrine of salvation rejecting all contrary beliefs? Will you be diligent in your study of Holy Scripture and in your use of the means of grace? Will you pray for God's people and lead them by your own example in faithful service and holy living? Will you accept the church's order and governance, submitting to ecclesiastical discipline, should you become delinquent in either life or doctrine? Will you be loyal to the witness and work of the Reformed Church in America, using all of your abilities to further its Christian mission here and throughout the world? And to the deacons. As deacons, will you faithfully, diligently, and cheerfully manifest Christ's love and care, gather and distribute the offerings of God's people, visit and comfort the distressed, minister to the poor and needy, and strive to advance God's reign of justice and peace? And to the elders, as elders, will you faithfully, diligently, and cheerfully study God's word, oversee the household of faith, encourage spiritual growth, maintain loving discipline, and provide for the proclamation of the gospel and the celebration of the sacraments. So we're doing uh, the installation and ordination a little bit COVID style today. Typically, we would have the greater consistory, which is anybody that's ever been an elder or deacon, to come forward and lay hands on those that are being ordained today. But in light of the circumstances, we're not going to do that. But I do want to invite the greater consistory, those of you that who are elders and deacons, if you would stand, and you sure can extend your hand towards these folks being ordained, but just as a sign of your fellowship and support of them stepping into this role, would the greater consistory please stand? And I'd like to invite, let's, um, Krista, if you don't mind going first, we'll start with you. Yep, go ahead. So let's pray together as we ordain Krista today. God of grace, pour out your Holy Spirit, gentle as a dove, burning as a fire, upon Krista Dreama, and fill her with grace and power for this ministry of deacon. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, may you remind Krista each and every day of how deeply she's loved and that she is dependent upon you, not just in this role of deacon, but in every role. And may you help her to experience your love and your grace as she seeks to follow you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Vinny, you want to go next? Let us pray again. God of grace, pour out your Holy Spirit, gentle as a dove, burning as fire, upon Vinnie Kluster, and fill her with grace and power for this ministry of deacon. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, may you remind Vinnie each and every day of who she is in you. May she experience the gift of your love and your grace. May she faithfully follow you in the way that she lives her life. And may you help her in all that she does, in every role that she plays, including this role as deacon, may she be dependent upon you. Thank you for the gift that she is and for this call that you've placed upon her life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And then for Joanne. Let's pray together for Joanne. God of grace, pour out your Holy Spirit, gentle as a dove, burning as fire, upon Joanne Dekinga and fill her with grace and power for this ministry of elder. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Father, I pray that you too would remind Joanne of how deeply she's loved by you, that she is a daughter of God, that she is yours. And may you help her as she looks at all the different roles that she plays and the responsibility that she has. Help her to do so dependent upon the power of your spirit, seeking after your wisdom and counsel, Thank you, Father, for her heart for others. And I pray that you give her wisdom as she seeks to express that love and the truth of Jesus Christ with others as she serves in the role of elder. 
and as she serves in all areas of her life as a follower of Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Joanne. So Mark and Bill are previously elders and deacons. That's why they're not being ordained today, but they are being installed today. So you may be seated. So in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the only head of the church, I declare that Krista Jerima and Vinnie Kluster are ordained to the office of deacon, and Joanne Deckinga is ordained to the office of elder. So elders and deacons, be faithful in performing your duties. Magnify the one who has called you to these high and holy offices. Be zealous for the church of Christ, hospitable, prudent, upright, devout, and self-controlled. Love goodness, holding always to the mystery of faith. And then we recognize today that not only as they step into the ser- to serve today, but they need your help. They need your encouragement. They need you to re- respect them and, and recognize them as elders and deacons. So I would ask the congregation to stand. So brothers and sisters in Christ here at Community Reform Church, today we affirm your covenant with elders and deacons whom God has given us. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, do you receive, in the name of the Lord, these deacons and elders as duly elected and ordained servants of Christ? If so, say we do. Do you promise to respect them for the sake of the offices for which they have been chosen and ordained? If so, say we do. Do you promise to encourage and pray for them to labor together in obedience to the gospel for the unity, purity, and peace of the church, the welfare of the whole world, and the honor of our Lord Jesus Christ? If so, say we do. Beloved people of God, receive these deacons and elders as Christ's own servants. Support them in love, that their work may may bear fruit. In the name and by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, I declare that these brothers and sisters are duly installed deacons and elders at Community Reformed Church. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me, please? God, we give you thanks for these men and women and their willingness to step into this role. May you remind them that you have called them to this role that you will be with them in the journey and the way that they serve, in the way that they love, in the way that they perform the duties of elders and deacons. And Father, I pray that you would help us to live into that covenant that has been made, that we will promise to pray for them, that we will encourage them, that we will respect them, that we will recognize that we're on this journey together in seeking ultimately the mission of your church to help other people see and receive the gift of Jesus Christ. Help us to be faithful in that mission as we are dependent upon you. Help what we do, these elders and deacons, and what we do as a church to glorify you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You guys may be seated too. have a microphone on so will you stand with me again as we uh, continue to worship and we just continue to praise the Lord that we put our trust in him this morning and that he is worthy he is worthy of all of our praise above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever save worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we 
Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, we live for you, and holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside. I will build my life. Ah. Uh -huh. 
live our lives upon you this day. We say there's no one like you. And Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. You are welcome here. Flood this place and fill the atmosphere, Jesus. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've taken of the sweetest of love where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord Holy Spirit you're welcome here and hope There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence Lord. and hope Glory of your good. 
pray together. Father, I pray that that would be true, that you would help us to be overcome by your presence. So easy to get caught up in the things that we need to do, get focused on the activities around us and working for you. Father, help us to remember that what's most important is that we experience the gift of your presence, that we live in relationship with you, that we experience the gift of your comfort, of your encouragement, of your wisdom, of your truth, of your conviction, of your grace, that we learn to live a life where you are always with us. And so how we navigate every circumstance and every relationship is with you. So, Spirit, we pray that you would help us to experience that even now, that as we step into the gift of your word, as we experience your presence through the gift of this word, that you help us to hear. You help us to long for these words, to help us to grow, to help us to know you, to help us more faithfully to follow you, to help us experience the gift of your presence even more deeply. So, Spirit, do your work, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So we began this series last week. It's just a three-week series titled it Church and State. And last week, we focused our attention primarily in Philippians chapter 3 and really talked about this idea of citizenship and where citizenship comes from. And you know, part of what Paul was doing in Philippians 3 was really reminding us about who we are. And in the midst of all sorts of different ways that we can look at answering the question of who we are, that if we don't get the answer right to start, that we are citizens of heaven, that we are first and foremost children of God, that we, that is what defines us, then that's going to impact how we then navigate all the other roles. That if Christ is our first love, then we're going to navigate being a citizen of the United States and being a parent and being a spouse and being a friend and being a coworker and being a student in the way that honors God. But it's coming to recognize that we are aliens in this land and that God has called us to this heavenly calling of serving the people around us in a way that honors him and helps them to see him. Because we're going to step a little bit more deeply now into one of the key kind of characteristic attributes of a citizen of heaven. We're going to talk about what it means to be selfless. One of the joys of challenges of being a pastor and preaching consistently is I get to spend all week with this. And in some ways, it's such a blessing to be able to be called to focus attention in God's word. But part of what consistently comes in that is conviction. And this week has been a week of a lot of conviction. Because it's easy to say from a pulpit on Sunday mornings that we ought to be selfless. But for the other six days, seven days of the week when I'm at home, that's hard doesn't come naturally for me. I don't know if it comes naturally for you, but it doesn't for me. I was so aware over the course of this week of how, how easily I want to be served, how easily I have expectations of others, how easily, especially of my family, I want you to do what I want you to do for me. Am I alone in that? Just me? And I think part of the conviction, too, is not only seeing the propensity and the temptation to live in that place of selfishness, but also seeing the impact when I do. Seeing how much, you know, Anna's home this week. She's on quarantine, and so it means I get to do homework with her. And, man, that's rough. Because um, I don't want to do it, and I want her to act a certain way when we do it, and sometimes she doesn't. And we had our moments. And there's just a part of me that I want to do what I want to do. I don't want to deal with your fractions math homework. (laughs) 
So part of the challenge of today is both owning that temptation and recognizing that maybe part of what the Holy Spirit's going to surface for you today is there's some places where selfishness reigns. And I don't know what those places for you, but for me, it's most likely in the relationships that I'm closest to. One of the other things that we did last week is we talked about just this navigating love for country and how being a patriot means you love your country and there's so much to love about our country. There's so much about the values and ideals that our country was based upon. And one of them is highlighted in a famous quote by John Kennedy. And he says this, and this was in his inauguration address in 1961. So this was 60 years ago, if you can believe that. Where he said this, my fellow Americans, ask not what you can, your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. What, what a beautiful ideal that that is. But part of what you're going to hear today out of the Gospel of Matthew is that this ideal is so much further than what we see in the United States of America. This is foundational to being a follower of Jesus Christ, to be a children of God, child of God that we live out of this sacrificial and servanthood grounding. Not because it's just what Jesus told us to do, it's what Jesus did. And for us to live into this ideal within our country, but even more so within all the relationships and roles that we play, part of what I hope that you hear today is how critically important it is that you and I experience the presence of Christ. Because it's by the power of his that we are actually able to embrace this life of selflessness. Because in the world that we live in and in the sinful nature in our heart, this is what we so often are encouraged to embrace, that it's all about you. Materialism and individualism and consumerism all encourage us to believe that it's all about us. And when we come with that posture, we come from a very different place than where God is calling us to come from. And I hope that this text today reminds you of not only what Jesus said, but what Jesus did. And this call that we've been given to follow him. I came across this other slide because at the source of this challenge for us of where selfishness so often reigns is it comes out of this foundation of pride. And pride begins in Genesis, right? We see that as soon as God creates humankind, Adam and Eve, when left to themselves, give in to pride. And pride says these things. My way is always right. Others are wrong. I want attention and recognition. I have a right to because I'm entitled to and I deserve and I am better than others. Pride is very likely the foundation of all other sins. It is a high view of our own worth, opinions, and abilities. It is self-worship in which we exalt ourselves above God's person and purposes. Pride is also a sin against people because it is a failure to love and serve them. Contrary to pride are humility, meekness, goodness, kindness, love. Contrary to pride are often the fruits of the Spirit. When God's at work in our life, When God is transforming us, the fruit that we bear is contrary to pride. So we come with this challenge. We come with this part of our nature that if left to ourself, pride will reign. And you see throughout the story of Old Testament into New Testament the outcome of when pride reigns. From Adam and Eve in the fall to the sin of idolatry that the Israelites struggled with, to the challenges you see in the church where we want something other than God to be the object of worship. So let's acknowledge that challenge as we have this conversation today that one of the things that may be a practical application to this message today is I got to keep confessing that place of pride in me. I got to keep asking God to help me to see it, to confess it, and to do the work that I need to do with his help to not live from that place of pride. Because we all have stories we can tell of when pride has reigned in our life 
and not only how that's impacted us, but how it's hurt the people that we so often love, so we, we so dearly love. All right, so let's step into Matthew chapter 16 today, verses 24 to 26. But let me just tell you what comes before this, because what comes before this is really important in hearing what Jesus is going to say. So in Matthew 16, you see Peter have a couple different experiences. It's in Matthew 16 that you hear Peter acknowledge the truth of who Jesus Christ is. You are the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus says, Alleluia, you got it right. You see me for who I am. You see me as a Savior, not only of you, but of the world. That I am the anointed, the chosen, the sent one. Great job, Peter. That's right. And immediately following that story comes the next story with Peter, where Jesus is helping prepare the disciples for his departure. And he's being very honest about what this is going to mean. It's going to mean his death. And Peter will have none of that talk. And so Peter confronts Jesus and says, look, that's not the plan that's going to happen. Listen, Jesus, my plan's better than your plan. And it's in that moment when Jesus looks at Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. Because when our plans are what driving us It is contrary to God's plan. Get behind me, Satan. And so it's out of that, right, where Peter gets it right, and then where Peter falls greatly short as Jesus is trying to help the disciples prepare for his life to come to an end and what lies ahead for them. We come to this text. Well, first, let's get a definition here of selfless. This is the definition, I think, that's helpful for us with selfless. Concern more with the wishes and needs of others than with one's own, unselfish. Just hearing that definition is convicting to me. How often am I concerned more with the wishes and needs of others than with myself? How often do I embrace a posture of unselfishness? Like yesterday, I, I um, told Elisa, I, Elisa does not like doing grocery shopping. And so yesterday, I knew that she was needing to do grocery shopping. So, so I'll do the grocery shopping is that because then I get to get what I want. So there is some not always clear, uh, healthy motivations. But I did the grocery shopping. And as I was driving home last night, feeling really good about myself, you know, look what I did. I did the groceries for Elisa. So she didn't need to do that. And all of a sudden, it just dawned on me. I got to give this message tomorrow. And look what I'm doing. Look at how often I, how easy it is to turn a generous, kind act to look at me, look at me, look at me. Listen to these words that Jesus expresses about what is foundational to our following of him. So this is Matthew chapter 16, beginning in verse 24. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Now, for those of you that have grown up in the church, you've heard this text multiple times. You've probably heard multiple handfuls of sermons directly about this text. And I just really encourage you not to check out in this moment. All right, I've been there, done this. I kind of know where Chip's going. Please don't. Because this is so important in us living into our citizenship, being grounded in heaven, that we as followers of Jesus Christ are called to a sacrificial and a selfless life. Where we really are here to put other people's needs and wants ahead of our own. And it's not just because Jesus told us to do it that we do it. It's because Jesus did it. And we are called to follow him. Let them deny themselves. Right? I'm pretty convinced that our capacity to be a spiritually and, and emotionally mature person is directly related to our capacity to tell ourselves no. that part of the foundation of our growth is our growing capacity to say no to ourselves. And it's not just about the big bowl of ice cream at night. 
It's about saying no to us being the Lord and, and the in charge and the in control and the I'm going to do it by myself and I'm going to do it by my ability person. Saying much more a yes to surrendering to our need for Christ. Take up their cross and follow me. So Jesus says, for those who want to save their life will lose it and those who lose their life for my sake, we'll find it. Right? For, for those who want to save their life, for those who want to make life what you think life should be, for those that want to pursue whatever dream, whatever hopes, whatever plans that you have, for those that want to have the greatest comfort and the greatest ease and the most freedom, for those who want to determine what the future plans for their life looks like, they're going to lose it. It's not going to fulfill. It's not going to satisfy. And it's going to hinder you from the heavenly calling that God has given you. You know, it's one of the things that is interesting about my job is doing funerals and having conversations with families and it's really interesting at times to say, well, what are we going to say about this person? What are they going to say about me when I'm not here? What are they going to say about you? And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. So not only I, do I hope you hear these words, but I hope these words surface for you some of your experiences. Right? We can all tell stories of when we decided what the best plan was for our life and for others. And we took control and we made it happen. And all, so often that was driven by our own selfishness, our own ambition, our own desire to be in charge. And we all have stories to tell of what that's led to. I had a conversation the other day with somebody who was looking back at their life with a bunch of regret. Because they believed that what was most important was that they worked hard so their family could have as everything they wanted. And so they worked and worked and worked and worked. And they worked and worked and worked and worked. Weekends were work. Vacations were work. And now they're looking back. And there's a bunch of regret of all the missed opportunities, the missed experiences with kids and spouse, because they're coming to see that what they valued when they made those decisions is not near as important as they thought. Because what they are looking back as in all the missed experiences of relationship with people they love and shared experience and shared time. And it's part of what I hope that you hear too when we sing that song about the importance of God's presence We all long to be loved and known and valued, not just because of what we do for other people, but because of who we are and the experience of being with us. And Jesus is just like that. He longs for us to experience and love being with him, not just, it's nice all these things you've done for me. And then think about those experiences in your life where you've chosen the path of sacrifice and servanthood where you operated from a posture of humility and you had a chance to see the blessing that that was, not only to you, but to the people around you. You saw that that's where life is found. When you actually gave up yourself for the sake of Christ and for the sake of somebody else. And then he concludes, for, those, for what will they profit if they gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? We, get, we got one shot at this life. And what's so nice is God is always standing at the door, inviting us to step more deeply into the life that he has. No matter where we've been in the past, no matter what has or hasn't happened, that invitation is always there for you and I to step 
one step closer with him into the life that he has. So I want you to hear this text again, but I want you to hear it from um, F. Dale Bruner's translation. So F. Dale Bruner wrote a phenomenal commentary on the Gospel of Matthew. You probably figured out he's one of my favorite commentators. He's only done Matthew and John, so anytime I'm in Matthew and John, I find it very helpful. But he's translated this text, and I think hearing it through his translation is really helpful, especially for those of us that have heard this text over and over and over and over again. Listen to how he words it. He says this, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wants to come behind me, that person must turn away from oneself and take up one's cross and live a life following me. Come behind me. That's what a follower does. Comes behind the one that they're going to follow. Must turn away from oneself. Must turn away from all of those selfish desires, all the desire to look good and to be in control and to value what other people think or whatever it is that we want to put value in, to turn away from those voices, from those temptations, and to really allow Jesus to be the one that defines who we are. I had a conversation with somebody else this recently, and they were talking about some of the journey of their life. They had gone through divorce, and coming out of that, there was a lot of work in regards to kind of growing through that. And one of the things that they said that struck me is I had to learn how to love myself. And there's such a difference, isn't there, between loving yourself in a selfish way. That's really not love. Right? That's idolatry. But loving yourself in a way that you come to see yourself in the way that God sees you. And you come to recognize that who you are is who he says you are must turn away from that selfish self and embrace the truth of who you are and take up one's cross and live a life following me. Not make one decision once, but live a life where I keep choosing to follow Jesus. So in the heat of the moment, when I'm angry at Elisa and we're in the midst of a difficult conversation, that I choose in the moment to humble myself. That it isn't about winning or control. That it's about humbly seeking to listen and love my wife. Live a life following him. He goes on to say, because whoever wants to save one's life will ruin it. But whoever throws one's life away out of devotion to me will actually save it. I love that image of the throwing. It's everything. We put it all out there. All of our life, all of our resources, all of our time, all of our relationships. We give it all to him. We'll save it. Because what good will it do a person to have won the whole world but to have lost one's own life? I mean, what kind of bargain can a human being strike to get back one's life? You can't. You can't change the past. But you can change today, which means a change for tomorrow. I love this quote by F. Del Bruner. He says, if anybody... If anybody wants to come behind me, so he's quoting what he's just written in the translation, if anybody wants to come behind me, presumably that is where disciples by definition are, but that is exactly the problem. Not all disciples remain there, remain behind Jesus. As Peter's quite recent getting in front of Jesus has depressingly illustrated. So what a picture you see in Matthew where where Peter looks at who Jesus is and they're trying to figure out actually who he is and Peter stands up and says, he is the son of God, he is the Messiah. And Peter has chosen to step behind Jesus. I am going to follow him because of who he is. And it isn't another paragraph later where he steps away from behind Jesus and steps in front of Jesus and says, look, Jesus, your plan to die ain't going to happen. And Jesus says, 
get behind me because what you're seeking to promote is the opposite direction that I need to go. So how, where are you behind Jesus? And where are you not? Again, for me, the most difficult place to be behind Jesus is in my closest relationships. I don't know that that's true for you. But I'm most likely to live in a posture of self admish and you owe it to me, and what have you done for me lately with those closest to me? So, because there's a huge difference, isn't there, between just following me and following my teachings. And this is part of the challenge of the church, isn't it? It's part of the challenge in my life. I can work really hard to do what Jesus has told me to do. But when I do it without following him, if it's not his presence and his power that I'm depending upon, I do a pretty poor job of following his teachings. And when I do follow his teachings, it comes with a whole bunch of pride. Look at me. Look how much better I am than most of you. Look at how much blah, blah, blah. Because following Jesus is learning to live in relationship with Jesus, and that's how we follow him, by his power in seeking then to do what he says. So this picture reminds me of my spring break trip to Florida. (laughs) I made the decision early on, so Ann and I drove down there because John still had basketball stuff going on, so he and Elisa stayed behind. They ended up flying down after basketball season was over, but it was me and Anna in the car through the night to Florida. We've never been closer. (laughs) But we made a really good decision on that trip to caravan with the Titus family. And I made a really good decision right off the bat to say, I'm going to follow you, Brian, or Carrie, whoever was driving. And all of a sudden, this weight came off my shoulders, right? I'm not figuring out the route. I'm not dealing with the speed. All I have to do is keep this car in front of me and follow that car. And initially it was great. And then they don't drive like I drive. (laughs) And they pulled off a couple times way quicker without letting me know. And all of a sudden there's bitterness towards the Tituses because, oh my goodness, this is hard to follow. And I think about how that true that is in our following of Jesus. That on the one hand, there's incredible freedom that we can experience when we learn to have him be the one we look to. And again, his presence, not just his teachings. We learn to recognize we need to stay with him because he's going to take us where we need to go. He may not take us where we want to go, but he's going to take us where we need to go. And there may be twists and turns, and the way that he leads us may be very different than at times in what
murky quickly because we recognize that Jesus says we're saved by Jesus' work grace that you've been saved through faith and this not your own works it's a gift of god not by works so that no one can boast we recognize that it's his work that saves us but we also see multiple places where jesus talks about the judgment that's to come and that there are some who think they're in but they're not in because their life is not reflecting following jesus And I think it's important for us to hear that again today, not to take away the assurance that if you've given your life to Christ and you believe in him and you're seeking to live a life of following him, there's no doubt about where you're going. But if you think that the Christian life is I made a decision a long time ago and it really isn't a decision that I'm following through on at all, then I think you've got some things to be concerned about based on what Scripture says those who are knocking at the door of Jesus and he opens them and goes, I, I don't know you because you don't know me. Boy, this is really important. Please don't hear me saying you've got to earn your way into heaven. That's not what I'm saying. But let's be honest about where our loyalty lies. Let's be honest about where our commitment is. See, the beauty about following Jesus is he does not take off like I did to my wife. He stands there in front of you, looks back, and whenever you're ready, he is right there in front of you for you to follow. He is not going to get far ahead of you. He is right there. And when you're ready to follow him, he will be there. So I reworded Kennedy's statement kind of as an overall thing for today. Ask not what your wife can do for you, but ask what you can do for your wife. Ask not what your son can do for you, but ask what you can do for your son. Ask not what your boss can do for you, ask what you can do for your boss. Ask not what your church can do for you, ask what you can do for your church. The posture of selflessness puts other people's wants and needs ahead of our own. And we do that not because Jesus just told us to do it, because Jesus did it and continues to do it. He has shown us that this is what it means to follow him. And please, 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 don't walk out of here thinking you're going to do this by your power. What we need to do probably more than anything else is come before God and surrender, surrender, surrender. I got asked that question this week. One of my friends is like, so Chip, you're in your 50s now. What, what, what's going to be like kind of the growing areas for you in your 50s? What, 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 what are your hopes for ministry? What's your hopes for your life, personal, professional, in your 50s? And, you know, put me on the spot. I didn't really have a good answer at that point. Started talking about some of the things I wanted to accomplish. And he's like, you know, I wonder if that may be what's most important for you for you to accomplish in your 50s is that you grow your capacity to surrender to Jesus. And there's something about that I think is really true. Of learning to surrender, of learning to live in relationship, of learning to be dependent, not just to be productive. Let's pray together. God, we give you thanks for the gift of this word. And I pray that you help us by the power of the Holy Spirit to make it a priority for us to live in your presence and to embrace it. To embrace it in the heat in the moments when we're in difficult conversations. Jesus, help me to surrender and to humble myself in the midst of this moment. Help us to do so in the midst of making decisions about finances or plans or how we use our time, that we look to you first, and we invite you to guide us in the midst of that. Father, maybe for some folks today, what they needed to hear was to be convicted of some places in their life where they are not behind you. They are ahead of you. They are telling you what needs to take place. Father, forgive us when we take the posture of the thr- sitting on the throne of our life in your second place. And Father, maybe for some of us today, this is a good challenge 
good challenge to see that you call us to an all-in life, a life of sacrifice, a life that's not about what we want or what we can get from this life, but it's a life of giving, serving, of loving. So Spirit, help us. Help us to keep seeking after you and to keep being in the place where we are following you. And what a gift it is that you will take us to places and into circumstances and situations and experiences that we could never get to apart from you, where we see that you actually do work through and in us that glorifies you and draws people to you. So may we pursue you. Thank you again for the gift that you are, for this word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand one more time as we sing our closing song? Holy, holy, holy are you, God. He is holy. Lord, help us to surrender. Help us to surrender to you, God. Help us to follow you. And not try and leave. Let's sing this together. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy.
speak that lies ahead. May we live in awe of who God is, especially as he's revealed himself to us in Christ. And may we live a life of following him as we love and serve and sacrificially give ourselves away for the sake of him and for others. Go in peace. Amen.